Um, hi, everyone. <laughs> so um, it's a bit of a challenge of now after Christian's talk going with this, but um, because it's a bit component wise, but I would also want to see you this talk in a way of perhaps something to consider for simulation perhaps in the future. Uh, let's see what you think about this. But I had a, a similar question at the start. I Christian, what is conversational search? Why are we doing this? And one thing that came up also in Christian's talk is about giving people the possibility to ask complex questions. And I have seen not much of this in the literature. So first, perhaps, what is a complex question? And let's see if I can, yeah. And fortunately, um, Nadia and Benjamin yesterday gave an example of this. Uh, this would be complex, perhaps a bit too complex to be realistic, but um, is this something that we could think the conversational system might at some point be able to do? That's the challenge that I ask myself. And what has this to, to do with conversational theory reformulation? Well, for this, also a step back, what is conversational theory reformulation? Um, and I start with this with normal theory reformulation, also because the terms sometimes get intermixed. It's similar also theory refinement is a different term, but it's different to theory revising, which I'll come to later. Like you have a search engine, like here you're looking for news, type in a keyword, COVID-19, you get news. So, but then the user is not totally satisfied with this. Perhaps they change their mind. They, maybe they saw something that made them to explore the topic differently. Or maybe they, in the first place, already wanted something else and were very disappointed that the search engine didn't immediately recognize that they were looking for vaccination. These are all scenarios where they reformulate the query. In this case, they added the vaccination term, results changed. That's reformulation, and that's what I'm talking about. What, how would this look like in a conversational setting? Like in this case, I have a, a chat application for information seeking. We call it newsbot. So quite a different start instead of having a query box, there plus what's up. And in the in the uh, let's say traditional query interface, we had COVID-19. What would you say here? Uh, I would have said, well, can you give me the latest on COVID-19, which is awfully long, but perhaps a bit more fun to type into. And you would expect that you get results similar to in the previous case. And now comes the point to which I would want to raise your attention to. We had COVID-19 vaccination in the reformulation case, non-conversational. So I hope you are all well awake after the lunch, because now I asked you, what would you say here in the conversational interface? I would give you a few seconds to consider. Think about your mind, make up your mind. What would you type in? Okay, got it. Uh, I'll be excited for this. Uh, so, perhaps for us, the trick, uh, the, the trick question who of you thought about um, not typing in anything, but having a look whether there is an edit button and then change COVID-19 to COVID-19 vaccination. So offense. No one got so far. Well, okay. Uh, who would have typed in, well, can you give me the latest on COVID-19 vaccination? Ah, okay. That, of course, breaks my heart, but uh, that's <laughs> some good conversation about it. I can live with this, but it's not for me. Um, and now comes a question where I'm also very curious to see. Um, who of you would have had the term COVID-19 in their theory? I mean, of course, you. Yeah. yeah, that's what not. Oh, that's actually, I would have expected a few. That's it. That's it. Yeah, so here's what I would have done. Ah, damn it, Zoom. <laughs> I would also not have typed in COVID-19 because it already knows, yeah? And I think that's the, it's a very interesting thing. Uh, it's a beautiful thing. I, I think it's, it's um, a wonder of conversation. 
So I would want. Actually, now I think I could uh, stop my talk because that's what it's about. About that it's actually already solved. Yeah, how would people do reformulation conversations? Of course, it's a natural language interface. We all know how. But of course, that makes a bit of problems on the on the other side of the system side. And that's something that I also want to talk about. But I want to just want to, yeah, I just want to point this out. Making it natural interface solves problems like this. And why is this important? Because if we now go back to Nadia and Benjamin, like I can break this down in just seven different theory formulations. And they are not trivial, but I think there is something that you can comprehend. While if I have to quote Nadia from yesterday, she herself having written this would not be able to understand this. By the way, thanks a lot for Nadia and Benjamin for allowing me to use this example. I think the talk much better. So, but this doesn't solve the problem of how on the system side we deal with this. And here, I want to point out that when we're doing conversation, I'd like to imagine this like a layer on top of what we have been doing so far with Lucene or Elasticsearch or create graph databases like Alex did. I promise to um, call them out here. Um, it really doesn't matter, but we have this additional layer on top of it that kind of handles the things that people say and also brings in all the, all the other components that Christian mentioned in the past, in the um, previous talk. So I still didn't answer the question of how to handle this. Uh, I think there are two approaches to this. The first one is theory rewriting, which is the thing that is done in the conversational QA, QA setting, which you just modify the theory by adding things. So if you would follow this approach uh, by the end of, by the end here, we would be back to have this and ask our language model to interpret all this. And this might work, uh, as Hinrich pointed out in the morning, it's a wonder what a language model accomplished. Maybe they can work with this, but maybe not. And this is the second approach that we really see this. They're doing theory reformulation. Why shouldn't we on the system side um, account for this? It's like a more symbolic approach. We say, okay, what they really wanted to say when they said just about vaccination, please, or when I said this, is I wanted to change my theory, even though the normal user probably thinks of a theory, but I wanted to change it that it's now just restricted to the results on vaccination. And this might sound now more complex than what we did before, but actually there are not many things I can do. I can add a term. I can remove a term and I can change a term. It's like very basic database operations. There you also have read, and which might make sense, especially in a voice setting where you don't see your query. So you could ask the system to, re to remind you of what you have actually so far. And we call this um, a kind of meter queries because we are using some kind of query language, changing the query that you actually have for the system. So what we then wanted to check is how do people do this? Yeah, we, we had a look at a few conversational search data sets. We found that this is in there. People are doing the query reformulation that we expected, but we wanted to have a control setting that we really wanted to put a focus, focus on what's the variety of language that is used. So we did a mechanical Turk study 284 participants from five English speaking countries. We had four search domains, argument search, search for books, for news, like we saw, and for trips. And they all followed the same um, task list. I'll show you a bit more on the next slide, but it was always like you add a term, then you remove a term. We, we made it uh, based on this correct terminology. It's just that for for news, you were looking for COVID-19, and for arguments, you were then looking for arguments against banning plastic bags. So we just kind of changed terms a bit. So, and for this, 
we created a data set of 2,700 about messages that is now also publicly available after quality control. This is actually the interface that we had on Mechanical Turk for the crowdsourcing. And I don't want to spend too much time there, but if you afterwards have questions, I'm very happy to talk on this. Just should not be the focus here. Let's just say we took quite some time to make it so that we would um, influence the way people ask the questions the least as possible. I give you an example here. So this was task two, which I um, have here kind of in a Boolean way. It is about replacing one term with a conjunction. So instead of looking just for COVID-19, it's a look, looking for COVID-19 vaccination. So the example that I've been using so far. And there are lots of different answers that we got. Filter list of trust about vaccination, show me articles that mention vaccination. And here yeah, would also want to have another show of hands. So uh, both you think that those two first ones are semantically equivalent. Who thinks they are not equivalent? Yeah, okay, the yeah, just need a bit more time. Sorry, uh, we can talk, but I come to this in a moment. Think about this. What's the difference here? Please filter out all articles. I think that's very interesting because in the first one they use filter, but they said these are the ones that should remain. And now in the third example, they again use filter, but they say these are the ones that should go away. So there are different kinds of ways people think about search. And we see this here, but they are all come down to the same um, intent that you want to have. So now come, uh, there are some more examples, but um, I come back to the first two, because what I want to point out here is that there is a big problem um, because the second example actually can be interpreted in a different way. Show me articles that mention vaccination may not be, I want to add vaccination to our query. It may be, okay, COVID-19 fine. Now I want to inform myself about vaccination. So I start a new query. There's also another one that could be kind of interpreted in this way. It's not totally clear here because of the only, but that's the thing. And in our data set, we actually found that about two thirds of the queries we had could be interpreted also as starting a new query. And even more, there's like the show me articles that mention vaccination. It could be that it's not an, I want to have um, queries about COVID-19 and vaccination. It could be a or. So I want to have queries, uh, uh, results, sorry results on COVID-19, and then I would also want to have results on vaccination. This might, in this case, be perhaps not plausible, but then we, how do we teach uh, search engine what's plausible in a sense? And then I have another example that we kind of also constructed, and you just to illustrate you how far we got with this way of doing the crowdsourcing study, so we now also have an have an OR, so you should replace this, but it was added the vaccination, if it should be about either vaccination or treatment. As I said, it's about making complex queries. That's how we asked them to do this. And we got a lot of different ways of expressing this. And also there is some ambiguity. And in this case, it's unclear when they say OR treatment, what do they mean exactly? Yeah, would I mean an OR to the vaccination as that was asked for, or is it just they want more news on kind of two different things that they have here as researchers? Why would they want to do this? Because I think also um, there's some kind of personalization that can happen here. Like you can use these theories, you can make them once, and then you have your personal feed. So it could be that someone is just currently creating what they are interested in. They are interested in COVID-19 and the vaccination of this, and they are interested in the treatment of several kids. So what I want to, to say here, um, how does they specify complex theories? I think this problem is kind of solved because natural language does this for us. 
but it's um, it's difficult to to interpret it. Not just because there's a large variety of formulations. I think that's the thing that with language models we can do very well in the future, but also because there's inherent ambiguity. And that's something that we should investigate more in the future. How can we deal with this? One thing might be that we ask clarifying questions. What did you actually mean? Another thing that I find interesting is that we could try to teach the users to use unambiguous language, like such word trust, add, add, um, few that they say want to have fewer that they use words like remove or add that could work. Um, when we compare the different search domains, we found out that the differences are there but not too large. So I, it's slightly feasible to do a formulation module that works um, amongst several of those domains. So that's a good news, I would say. And if you would like to also have more topics to discuss. Um, what I found interesting is that in natural language, we actually use a lot more search operators than we use in normal queries, like in search engines, like negation, that's totally normal. Um, what's called boosting in Elasticsearch, like something a bit more on this topic or so, that's all Google. And yeah, that's where I want to end my talk. I hope you are interested in this and as excited as I am. Thank you. Any any questions from the public? Yeah. Oh, microphone again. <laughs> I'm moving too much. Uh, here, here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you will see that mic at the end of the day. I need to put it. Okay. Okay. So thank you very much for the nice talk. Um, you, you mentioned this uh, issue that the users sometimes um, give some sort of fuzzy uh, input, right? But if you have a dialogue system, you can also use it and ask the user again, so what do you really mean here by this and that example? Have you thought about this? Yeah, so I think that that's what I meant with then that we ask clarification questions afterwards. And I think there are just different ways of doing this that would be interesting to look at in the future. Like, um, how do we tell them that this was ambiguous? Do we tell them, uh, do we give them the query like uh, in an ambiguous way and ask them, is this really what you meant? Or do we ask them, like, give them an example result and ask them, should this be part of it? So I think that's a good way of doing it. Especially in, when you don't know anything of the user so far or the situation they might be in. Clarification questions, I assume, would be the way to go. Yep. Here's another question. Yeah, nice talk. Um, I've also been thinking about conversational as being more meta level. And then I was wondering so now all the meta questions are about. Uh, a whole result list. But you could also have the same while people are inspecting individual elements of the result list. Did you think about that? That you would say, like, oh, I prefer document one more than two, or the other way around, or this is not relevant anymore because now I know this already. So you could actually talk about what you're doing. Ah, that's interesting. No, I mean, so we were aware that there's a lot of things that users can actually do. I haven't thought yet about um, like critiquing. That's what what it's called. Yeah, how, I mean, sure, pe people will do this. I'm I'm pretty sure they will say, "Oh, that's that's bad." And we could probably also have this as kind of then reformulating the query to not like this one, so, especially in image search. Very very it's hard to describe what you actually mean, and then but it's easy to say. That's wrong, and it's more like this. Yeah, very good point. Thank you. Any more questions? Oh, all right. Okay, Johannes. Uh, so, from what I understand from the slides, uh, you were giving uh, explicit instructions to the workers to exactly. So, did you ever 
test like in a more realistic setup, uh, like when they are trying to actually solve a, an information need and then you give them results, they have to reform you. Did you ever test to see you are seeing the same kind of behavior or is it something for the future? Um, so we didn't test this afterwards, but um, what we did beforehand is that we looked at the data sets that you run. Um, um, or what would say collected, sorry, um, where she had to set up that someone was talking to someone else sitting at a machine operating a search engine. And there we found also that they said something like, um, no more in this direction or so. So in these data sets, it was there, which I think gives um, an impression, but it was not um, too often. I think also it's you know, not totally the situation that we will have in the end. But um, yeah, yeah. So I think there is some hint that this will happen. I'm not sure how often it will happen. Normal query reformulation in the in the, in the query box interfaces happens very often. So um, I would guess this also happens often, but I'm not sure. No, uh, sorry. I was mainly wondering, like the type of reformulations that you see. Do you think they are realistic? Um, so I think this distinction between and and or, that's not something that users have in their mind, but um, they don't need to have this in their mind, yeah? They, they just have something in their mind and they can't really formulate it in a logical way. I mean, they're not mathematicians. They, yeah, have something in their mind that formulated and it could be anything. So I, um, for me, the question is not whether this is realistic, I think, all of this will happen at some point. The question is how often it occurs. And that's hard to estimate now also because there is no real widely deployed conversational search system out there. And over time, as systems get better, users will change their behavior. And my bet would be that this will occur more often the more people, um, the more people trust engines. Okay, last question. We have a question from, uh... Ahmed, uh, online. Yeah. Hi, uh, this is Hamad Zawani from UMass. Uh, so nice talk, thank you. The question I have is, so we have studied, like the community has studied query reformulations on web search for more than two decades. And uh, there are multiple ways of doing query reformulations, for example, query specialization, generalization, and so on. Uh, so I am wondering what is the connection between query formulation and uh, like general keyword search and conversational search? And do you see any fundamental differences? Yeah, um, thank you. That's, that's a very good question. Um, so I think um, the, the difference is that in the conversational setting, people don't think about the query. Yeah, they just think, they, they asked for something, they got something. And um, they now see it's not exactly what they wanted or they changed their minds. So they use, um, it's more like a, it's more subconscious, yeah? They, they don't have to go this direction of thinking about query terms, they are just talking. And I think so in this way, people will formulate differently. As I said, I guess they will use more of what are, what's called search operators. And um, so that, that's a difference. But I think in the end, from a system's point of view, we can break it down to something that becomes very close to each other. Like they, like for our for system's point of view, it is similar, I would say. Does this answer the question? Yes, thank you. Okay. Okay, I think we need to move on. Uh, let's thank the speaker.